to the historian as we continue on our coverage of the first, which will be hopefully annual, uh, Avalon Expo exposition here in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, joining me, of course, once again is my good co-host, Stylin Steve Blake. I'm still here. You're still here. Uh, <laughs> your sound, your sound, sound. There not, I am. Your sound is not though. I'm back. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I've I've snagged a guest that I've wanted to talk to for a long period of time. Once I found out he was going to be coming here. It is the writer artist of the brand new series, Captain Canuck. Um, where's the video? Right here? Yeah. Right there. Okay, Captain Canuck. This is number one. He signed it for me as well, too. So, uh, from Chapter House Comics, uh, Canadian writer artist, uh, Kelman Androsovsky. Say that right? Close enough. Close enough. Androsovsky, I there believe. You go. There you go. There okay, you go. there you go. Uh, how are you? This is your first time in Newfoundland, isn't it? It is. I'm groovy. Yeah. We're and having a groovy time. How's the sound? Steve, good? Okay. Yeah, don't leave Jared out of this. Don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna let me do the bulk of yes, this. Yes, you do the bulk of this. He doesn't know comics like uh, I know I'm comics. I'm not a huge comic book nerd. I gotta give it that right All away. Right. Uh, first off, I want to say congratulations on Captain Canuck, the success of Captain Canuck. Thank you um, very much. It's so difficult uh, as a Doctor Who fan. When they brought the series back, when they brought Doctor Who back, they had so much that they had to live up to. It was an iconic character. They had to refine it and redefine it for a new generation of people. I want to ask you primarily that when you take a character as well established as Captain Canuck, such a classic character that you know means so much to so many people, like a cult hero, what was the first thing you said when you had to refine it and redefine it? Like, how did you approach that? Well, Doctor Who <laughs> is uh, a much beloved character of many generations, mm -hmm. and yeah, there was a fallow period in the '90s after Sylvester McCoy and the movie with Paul McGann. Man knows Doctor Who. There you go. Um, so it had kind of receded, and so I guess it was a good time for them to bring it back because mm -hmm. while there was all that love, there were all the fervor had cooled. You know, there were even kids who had grown up without it. Um, Captain Canuck, on the other hand, was not beloved by very many people. <laughs> I think everyone was excited about the idea of a Canadian superhero, mm -hmm. and he had a he had a cool costume. Um, and like most people that I talk to, have vague memories of a flag wearing superhero who looked kind of nifty. But nobody, nobody that I know that I encountered really was invested in the stories or really invested in, in really being a fan of the character. It was more like I sort of remember seeing one at my friend's house. That's my story. Um, and I, you know, I have I have that nerd memory that memorizes superheroes and costumes very easily. Details. Um, background details, powers, all that stuff. So I always felt like I knew Captain Canuck, but when I actually got approached to reboot it and I started reading through the old series, I was like, I've never read any of these. Um, I just had this impression. And everybody has this sort of vague, fond impression. But, but there is no hardcore Captain Canuck fans, or very few. Um, there are some. So it, it wasn't nearly as terrifying, I suspect, a prospect as bringing back Doctor Who, where you have to deal with um, fans from the 60s and fans from the 70s and fans from the 80s and fans from the 90s. Well, maybe not so many fans from the 90s, but you know what I mean. Um, well, I mean, I even vaguely remember we we have uh, locally, there was a, we had a Captain Newfoundland who was paired along the way. We'd see him with a Captain Canada or a Captain Canuck. I just learned figure. about him an hour ago. Uh, yeah. he, oh, man. <laughs> so many adventures Some for... trippy, for, trippy stuff there. He yeah. was originally Captain yeah. Atlantis and kind he was of like just a developed. Starlin character that, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, was left here during a con visit in 1977. But, <laughs> but I distinctly remember as a kid seeing him paired up with a Captain Canuck figure. Okay. So, I mean, it was there for us to see. But never really hit mainstream, at least for, well. Uh, that's well, a very specific demographic. I mean, trying yeah. to sell a character with maple leaves all over him to other places like America is well, really hard. They, uh, they don't realize so Wolverine is Canadian, so... Exactly. Well, he's <laughs> now, not really Canadian. <laughs> now, you, you have credentials having worked in Marvel, DC. When you look at, you know, the, the rise of Canadian heroes, or, or lack thereof, when you think of like Alpha Flight, would probably be Marvel's only real example um, of a Canadian super team. DC ignored Canada for a great period of time, what I've seen, except for the Justice League Canada, I believe, is the one now. But you look at Captain Canuck when you approach that, both as a you know somebody in the industry of comics, do you say, well, I had to do this to appeal to the Canadian fans that are there, or you look at it and say, well, I need to appeal to who's reading comics now, whether it's people who grew up reading the Ultimate series. You need to have a hard reboot. Yeah. Did, was there any? Was there any expectation that you could do it in a cheerful, chuckly way, or was it always going to be a hard reboot? I, 
I always, my, I always intended to take it seriously. I feel like you can come at anything um, if, with respect and sincerity and make something out of it. And you know, Captain Canuck has been hokey uh, in the past, um, and we didn't want to do that. Like that's, you know, I. You were talking about Alpha Flight earlier. Mm-hmm. Like, sure, the the Burn Run and the Bill Mantlo Run is one thing, but then you get things like Major Maple Leaf exactly. that yeah, make me want exactly. to shoot myself in the face. Yeah. And so I don't want to give, I don't want to throw more fuel on that fire. Um, I just tried to make it a good comic and a cool comic, and I tried to keep the essential iconic elements of the old one while uh, get jettisoning all the not good, silly, hokey, weird stuff. All the stuff that maybe didn't age so well. You know, um, the Captain Canuck, the original series, had a lot going for it. I mean, it was created and self-published by Richard Comley and, and produced by Canadians in Canada. George Freeman's artwork, starting with issue four, um, was so far ahead of any other indie comics at the time. I mean, the guy was a blend of John Byrne, P. Craig Russell, and, and Wendy Peeney. Um, and he, he could and should have been a giant. Um, and not to mention, Captain Canuck was printed with a far more sophisticated printing process than Marvel or DC at that time. They were, it was printed much the way comics are printed now. And so the colors were more vivid and richer. There's a much broader uh, color palette on those books. Um, they stand the test of time as artifacts of you know, where, where comics went. Uh, but it, they're also a product of, of 1970s kind of, uh, you know, it is what it is. Read it, take it for what it is. It's uh, it, it's a beautiful artifact. I love the seventiesness of it. You know that that costume. Somehow there's something about it. Even the odd choice to end the red just above the belt. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. no one else has that. Yeah. I'm not sure what that was signifying, but it's it's a unique little costume flourish. So you had the advantage, really, of 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 the character, but you also had the disadvantage of how do I appeal to a modern audience with this character. So, I mean, not only did you completely reboot it, like when I read the first issue, I said, wow, like this is completely, it's still Captain Canuck, but it is so fresh and so new, you know, it's something completely you. different. And look at other characters, established characters, like you, you feminized a lot of the characters. Characters that we were... Starbucked everybody. <laughs> characters that were previously established as male characters, supporting characters, became female. And that obviously was, was that an attempt to broaden the demographic to the... To the body yeah, it was. That was another. That was sort of what I was talking about. Speaking to modernizing it in the original Captain Canuck series, everyone was a white male, um, <laughs> because you know if you're a Mormon in the '70s, that's your world. So yeah. that's the comic you make. Um, there was um, a development process that preceded me coming on board. I was originally recruited to redesign all the characters. Um, at the time, they didn't really know what they wanted to do with it. The rights had been acquired by a Toronto restaurateur named Fatty Hakim. Mm-hmm. And uh, he originally just wanted to have a kid's meal with Canuck branding and a Captain Canuck sandwich. And uh, in talking to Richard Comley, the creator, he was shocked to discover that nothing much was happening with a character that, to Fatty, was one of the coolest characters ever made. Mm-hmm. So he optioned the rights and, and pulled in two producers he knew, uh, Paul Gardner and Dean Henry. Um, who worked for CBC TV and TV Ontario to just kind of kick at the kick at the concept and, and, and reboot it, and so they had started sort of redeveloping the world, and they brought me in to kind of do the art, to kind of design the characters, and so a few of the con- things were already loaded in, like they kind of wanted armor, which I was down with, mm-hmm. and they wanted to make Redcoat a woman, mm-hmm. and I was like, no, you got to make, Ke-. and he said, and they wanted to make uh, Quebec a sniper, and I was like. I want a girl sniper. Yeah, like, that's yeah. what I want to see. <laughs> and you should give her a costume like Canucks, but branded for Quebec. And uh, and they were like, oh, okay. They thought about it. And they're like, well, let's make them both girls. So we made them all girls and uh, women. Excuse me. <laughs> and uh, and so you know, you start designing, you start thinking about the visuals and, and character things. Sort of bubble to the surface. And I started suggesting more and more ideas about where it could go. And they were very receptive and collaborative. And uh, and then that sort of led to the web series, the first web series, which fantastic. If you series. don't know, there's thank you. There's a five-part short web series. You can watch it for free at CaptainCanuck.com. There was a, fun, a, a Kickstarter uh, crowdfunding campaign uh, to make that happen through um, Indiegogo a few years ago. Um, and my role in that really was just the character designs. I did all the design work, um, and Dean and Paul wrote it. 
and the next phase, the next thing they wanted to do was to make a comic book series. And we talked about it, and I kind of was like, some of the stuff I want to stick to pretty closely, but some of the stuff I kind of want to go my own way. Like, the model was like G.I. Joe in the 80s. There was a comic, there was a cartoon. The characters had the same costumes and the same code names, but the story was a little different. Tonally, they went in different places. You know, the cartoon was kind of broader and done in one and simple, and the and the comic sort of developed a, a pretty tight backstory that sure. had a lot to do with real military things. And so that's sort of the path I want to walk. Like, the cartoon is kind of broad and simple, as it should be, three-minute episodes. You're not going to, you know... Um, I think it does the job great. It's punchy, it's fun, it's light. It, it is absolutely. It gets the job done. Absolutely. The comic is a little more, there's a little more backstory. There's a little more, a little more stuff going on. There's more characters. There's, there's more B-plots. Um, and it's a little more uh, a gritty and, and a more <laughs> military aspect is a little bit more there and so on and so on. Um, and so as I started developing the comic, Dean and Paul kind of stepped away and moved on to other projects. And uh, that's when I started sort of fleshing out the story more and kind of building building where it's going. And I, I kind of pitched them on a four arc sort of run and uh, they dug it and we started moving forward. And so that's the plan. But at the end of this, I'm hoping for about a 20 to 24 issue sort of m- big story and maybe you know maybe by the time we get there I'll, there'll be more that I want to do but that's my big plan everything is already sort of heading towards this larger sort of shape see I could ask him for spoilers but I'm not going to do that <laughs> but okay so if you look at the character so you know when, when you're talking about a character that wears the flag you're looking at Captain America and he deals with the American ideal of things like how Americans in general will approach a problem or maybe the way they don't approach a problem as somebody who's writing for a Canadian character what in in your head when you think to yourself well I need something that's going to be Captain Canuck the Canadian character who's dealing with military issues yeah. but Canada is such a different country from the United States with, with a character that's completely now new and rebooted what are the threat levels that you could possibly get away with that, that, sounds, that sounds meaningful and would make sense in a comic about a Canadian character what do you mean what do you mean threat levels well for example like what would a what would a, who would a Canadian superhero fight? Exactly, like you. I mean, you got the Red Skull. You have these international cartels. I know Mr. Gold obviously is an antagonist, but down the road, when you're thinking about a character that he has a, a '70s backstory, but that was never explored. Like I'm trying to say, basically, I'm not doing a very good job of it. But what I'm trying to say is, you have a character that is a flag bearer for Canada. And you're drawing a thin line between, is he going to be uber patriotic in the same sense that Captain America is? And is he going to explore what it means to be Canadian, basically? So, obviously, as a different country to the United States, Canada has its own problems and things that... How, how does Captain Canuck deal with things differently right. than another flag-bearing sure. character would? I get it. Um... Well, let's be honest. If you look at the way Captain America is portrayed in the comics and movies, he's m- much more Canadian than that character really would be. <laughs> he, like, if you think he's about, he's very polite. If you think he's, about, <laughs> yeah, he, he he smiles. He 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 says good night to his mother. It, it, yeah, it's, he's very Canadian. He roots for the little guy. Yeah, he's yeah. very politically like progressive and new or neutral. You know, he apologizes Whereas, after he kicks your ass. Yeah. <laughs> you if you unfroze a guy from the '40s, he would be like a virulent racist yeah. and yeah. probably like beat women and like he would be terrible <laughs> he would be like the hardest hard right republican like that's and that's not who the, who he is in the in the comics so it's interesting that like and he has a shield like a captain america would have all the guns mm-hmm. that's you true. Know? like that's it's true. weird like they, they've sort of branded him in a way in, in a way that i see as kind of canadian to avoid the political trap of, mm-hmm. of a flag wearing hero i mean some of the things from the initial design right away like Canuck uh, uses tonfa, which are like blunt, <laughs> blunt weapons. They're non-lethal. It's all about peacekeeping and, and, and sort of a, a more of a police kind of vibe than a, you know, than a than a vigilante with guns or knives or any of that. He's he's sort of conceived by us too to be kind of an aspirational hero, you mm-hmm. know, iconic and symbolic and and, and, a, and a, I guess a do-gooder, but. You know, everybody thought that Batman was the only kind of superhero that could work on the screen, and then Marvel put Captain America up there, who was a, a blue-eyed Boy Scout who didn't get the references, and it worked. Like, so I mean, we're just—I'm just going right up the middle with that. Like, I don't feel like there's any need to reinvent the wheel or try and deconstruct a character like that. I mean, our our Captain Canuck, uh, you know, served in the military. He fought in Afghanistan. 
Um, there's a lot of interest from military people right out of the gate when we announced this, and I felt like we need to lean into that and embrace that. The original Canuck was a Mountie mm -hmm. and Scoutmaster. Yeah. Um, In a fictional future 1993 as well. That's right. Oh. Did you ever realize that Captain America is a man from the past trapped in the future and Canuck is a man from the future trapped in the past? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, absolutely. They, yeah, they absolutely did that right. TV show. They called it Do South. Yeah, yeah uh, that's true. I might have said America twice. I meant yeah. America and Canuck. Mm. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is it, is it difficult to write a nationalist hero without any kind of political agenda? If your first approach yeah. to writing a comic is to be an enjoyable comic for yeah, people, I'm trying to but you have a, a character who has... The, the maple leaf right up front. Sure. You know? Well, the question is, like, what does that mean? Like, to me, like, there are certain Canadian values that I'm trying to make him embody, which is, like, good judgment, temperance, patience, mm -hmm. tolerance, a noble, nobility of spirit, mm -hmm. a willingness to step in on behalf of others. And these are sort of archetypal superhero qualities that you see in e everyday heroes, but maybe it's a bit of a throwback to a simpler time. Like, those were things that defined the heroes of, like, the 50s and the 60s and the... And, and maybe not the 70s. The 70s was a bit different. But I don't think that stuff has to be facile or empty. Like, you know, the primary relationship in the book is, is Captain Canuck's relationship with his brother. And uh, Canuck's brother, Michael, was in the original series. Um, I just want to, like, just touch on for a second. This is a reboot of the original Captain Canuck. There mm -hmm. have been a few other Captain Canucks. And all the other new versions tied into the old version and that they were sort of legacy characters mm -hmm. but this is a hard reboot so like you were saying some of the characters are now female mm -hmm. it's um it doesn't tie into the other the history in any way so uh canuck's brother uh was a small part of the other the other book but in, in our story he um he was born in the states he's an industrialist he's an ambitious uh charming somewhat manipulative like person with his own agenda and in their relationship like uh, Canuck is the younger brother Michael's the older brother they sort of are America and Canada to each other like there's a bit of that thinking in the way that I designed who they were and how they relate to each other and uh, you know uh, Canuck Tom kind of wants to do right by his brother and thinks the best of him all the time even when others are, are highly suspicious and Michael like loves his brother but he's kind of out for himself first and foremost and if it means, you know, stepping on his brother for a minute to get ahead, he'll kind of do it. You know, he may not put him directly in harm's way, but he may not, uh, how would I put it, uh, he may not stop something that's happening if he has something more important on his plate. And that, that relationship will continue to expand throughout the series. The first arc, they're never even together, except in flashback. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's sort of the primary relationship between them. They have this organization, Equilibrium, which... Mm -hmm which Michael started and uh, and kind of built around wanting to uh, bring his brother closer to him. And so he built a very idealistic philosophy behind it. Um, and so whether he means it or whether that's just a way to pander to Tom so that he can have Tom by his side is unclear and will emerge over time. But, uh, I mean, Tom believes the stuff he's into. He's, he's kind of a, he's a soldier. He's a straight-up guy. Um, yeah, is that sort of answer? Right? It does. It does indeed. It does indeed. And Chapter House Comics and, and publications, um, are they going to be expanding the universe of Captain Canuck into potential spin-offs? Is there, is there a market there for the secondary characters to get one-shots, anything different? Because the thing I love about this is that you have different covers as well. There's alternate covers to all this. So I think to myself, well, they they really went all in and invested into this character and this complete spin and, and fresh take on the character. Can you do the same thing, or is there anything in the works to do that for other characters as well, whether it be characters from Captain Canuck or other? There, um, th there is definitely a plan to expand. I mean, one of the things that's going to be happening is the backup stories that feature new adventures mm -hmm. of classic Canuck mm -hmm. will kind of turn into its own thing. Okay. And that there won't be backups in the second arc of the new Canuck anymore. That'll become its own thing. And there, they definitely are adding at least... Uh, at least a few other characters and expanding that universe. But the two the two the two streams don't cross. Like there's that Canuck and there's this Canuck. Right. Um, so you're to, never gonna see a time travel story or an ultimate universe story where well, they meet up. Never say never, but that's not <laughs> that's not in my immediate plan. Like the things that I want to touch on, that's not on the list. Who knows, maybe next year I'll feel differently. Mm -hmm. um, Chapter House, you know, just acquired the rights to publish The Pitiful Human Lizard, who is a Toronto-based vigilante that's been uh, having some self-published success over the last couple of years. They've already had a small crossover with The Lizard and Canuck in a, in a 
the, the lizard has these sort of side project little shorts that they put out. So that's already kind of happened. Those two have been established in the same universe, and there will be human lizard cameos in upcoming issues of uh, of New Canuck. In terms of like spinning out other characters, I mean, maybe I would love that. Mm. Uh, the, you know, it's it's really hard to fit everything into a 16-page story when the universe is already so big. True, sure, absolutely. Uh, I try really hard to make those 16 pages feel like 20 pages, and uh, you know, yeah, I mean, characters like Quebec and Redcoat, and there's even other people in the background that haven't really had their chance yet, like the pilot horse, the stuff about him that that is coming up, and and uh, Michael's driver is actually a vigilante in his own right, called the Steel Town Hammer, but he's really gonna, those guys are gonna kind of step out of the shadows in the second arc. Um, and so, yeah, hey, if somebody wants Steel Town Hammer comics, let me know. We'll make it happen. So, who is your favorite character to write for other than Captain Kidd? Is there anyone that is your muse that you go to and say, I like this as a supporting character, I can really get behind this character? I, I kind of like whoever I'm working on. I mean, right out of the gate, I, I was hot for Quebec. I kind of tried to set her up as sort of the silent, mysterious. She's kind of the Wolverine of the team. And... Uh, and, and issue five really kind of delves into her past and who she is, and it's kind of a spotlight on her. Um, but she doesn't say much, so I never really got into a real, like, intense groove. Um, but, you know, the flashback in issue three where we see how Kebe- uh, Canuck and Redcoat met the first time uh, really kind of made me click with her and, uh, you know, her English syntax and her attitude and who that character is. And then it, it's interesting, writing that scene, um, it kind of expanded... Uh, Hadn't, something I hadn't considered kind of clicked and uh, that character's got an even bigger role now because of that um, and then in, in issue 4 which is uh, is out in a few weeks there's there's a bunch of Michael and Canuck stuff in the past I mean the, their dynamic really kind of clicked into place and now I'm kind of loving that because you know Michael's kind of a cynical kind of dickish guy and the contrast of Tom's like idealism and like uh, die hard like you know we'll get through this no matter what compared with Michael's snark works really well and there's really good contrast to be had there. So I just like dynamic range. And so, you know, right now I'm all over the Canuck Michael thing. So who knows? Next issue it'll be something else. And when can we expect a 17 issue character arc involving Captain Canuck relocating to Newfoundland and staying here? And <laughs> just, you know, doing his thing here in Newfoundland. That's a 17 part epic. <laughs> yeah, and Captain, it's Captain Newfoundland bending reality. That's right. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Do you feel that you have to, I shouldn't say have to, but do you feel inspired to write different corners of Canada to say, okay, here's Captain Canuck, the national hero Captain Canuck, and he's doing things now in British Columbia, now he's doing things in Whitehorse, and now he's doing things in St. John's. Do you feel that he should be a national hero globetrotting in the sense that he goes from coast to coast? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the the point of equilibrium and that... You know, they go wherever they're needed, and primarily in Canada. The first arc, though, I mean, so much of it is set uh, pretty in the far north, Melville mm-hmm. Island mm-hmm. in the Arctic. Um, but the first two issues were kind of in the, on the oil sands. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the second arc, early on, actually, you'll see a lot of that, a lot of uh, how equilibrium deals with um, natural disasters, climate change, and, and various crises all over Canada. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, th- I, I, I kind of know where each arc is sort of set, and they're in different locations. Uh, yeah, that's hugely important. And we're doing that in the animated series, too, where, you know, we're cherry-picking the first one was set, in, you know, at first in Toronto, and then uh, or Ottawa, then in Toronto, then in Halifax, and uh, then in the Rockies. And, and for the second one, too, we're kind of we're putting it in a new spot that he hasn't been yet, and so on and so on. And as the writer-artist, do you write to the sense of, you say, oh, I'd love to be able, like, once you write something, you say, oh, I can actually make this artistically really good like which do you go for first do you write with the sense of I'm going to draw this right later or do you say well I'm going to draw it and then fill it in after the fact like what is your process when you're an artist you read scripts sometimes that make you want to bang your head against the wall because (laughs) the writer is demanding the sun and the moon in uh, you know one eighth of a page panel um, or doesn't think visually, and I'm the worst writer I've worked with for that. I, I gave myself a grueling, difficult script, and part of that is, is trying to pack as much story into, into a lower page count as possible. Um, so I didn't cut myself any slack. Uh, I'm a dick. Uh, but now, now, as of issue three, we have a new artist. Leonard Kirk is drawing the book, 
and uh, that's I've tried to be more conscientious. Uh, he can do it. He can more than handle it. In fact, he often adds panels to my pages, but I've tried to be very careful about panel count to not kind of overload him and give him room to kind of do something splashy or dramatic or, or a big moment. Uh, so yeah, I guess for me, like it starts with the script, and that's the part that is really where it's at for me now. And moving forward, um, it's been extremely rewarding to work with somebody of his caliber. Uh, and has, after um, a career, a long career of just drawing and writing for myself. And has Richard Conley given you any kind of um, thumbs up or thumbs down? Is there anything that you've done in this run that he said, oh, I don't know about that? Or has he just said, he okay, He didn't like it, the fact that we made them all girls at all. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> There's a video somewhere you can find online of us unveiling uh, Blue Fox. Right. When, I don't know if you, you remember, Blue Fox was like yes, a minor yes. character yeah, in minor the original character. issue yeah. one. We kind of turned him into like a, like Canucks Catwoman, you know, international like mercenary thief, sort of sometime ally, but mostly enemy. You know, as never, she is in the animated series. Right? As she is in the animated series, she hasn't appeared in the comic yet, but she will in the second arc. Um, and uh, you know, as we're as we're getting ready for the big moment, he's like, "Well, you didn't make him a girl too, did you?" We're like, uh, <laughs> uh, "About that, really?" Yeah. Um. So there was that. Um, the the one note he he gave me on the redesign is he wanted to add boots, so we added boots. The original uh, didn't have it. He had like like he had like footwear, obviously, mm-hmm. but he didn't have like superhero boots. It's, so those yeah, sort of yeah. those dramatic buccaneer boots were were to Richard's note, and mm-hmm. I think it improves and gives makes the design more balanced overall. Um, he's been involved every step of the way. I mean, part of the option deal is that he sees everything and, uh, and has, has an opportunity to speak up if he doesn't like the way it's going. And, and, give, and give, he gives his blessing on everything. So uh, he's been on board fully for, from day one. He grasps a little bit here and there. But <laughs> he, I think he's, he's really excited that something's happening with this character after so long and people are digging it. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's pretty yeah. much all I have. Um, before we let you go, um, let's make sure we get all this out here. Um, obviously, it's at Captain Canuck on Twitter. Um, yep. I'm trying to think of the other social media that might be. Uh, you have your own Twitter account as well. I do. It's at Evil Kalman. Yep, that's Kalman right. is K-A-L-M-A-N. And mm-hmm. it's the same on Instagram. And it is CaptainCanuck.com. Yep. Mm-hmm. You can the watch website. all the web series there. There's links to all the merch and, and when issues are coming out and so on and so forth. And I guess Chapter House has their own social media accounts yes, as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I so want to... I, mean, I, I have learned more about Captain Canuck than I have in the past. Captain Canuck is an awesome character. Yeah. I always like Captain Canuck. I, I, honest, I always did. I might, like, have to, I might have to borrow your autographed issue. You might have to. Yeah, you might, or you might have to go buy one. I might right have to go buy one. Yeah. True, true. One of the I many have characters. Lots. Yeah, mm-hmm. one of the characters over there. True. The spinoffs, I didn't know you that have there was so much spin off stuff like in terms of merchandise. Yeah. Like it's like it's like you reinvigorated the merchandise That's line. That's part as well. of the deal. I mean Fatty who who is the license holder, I mean he's a fan of the original mm-hmm. and so he was really excited to put it back on the map. I mean mm-hmm. there's a lot of things. There's even more coming. I mean we you know, there's maple syrup. <laughs> Well, I mean, come on. There's we we, we learned we learned it from Mel Brooks. Yeah. Spaceballs, the advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Do exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> so. But all of that stuff is what's funding our, our comic. I mean, we're not published by a Marvel, DC, or a corporate giant that puts out uh, movies and video games. Like it's just a bunch of fools in Toronto who want to make this go. So every keychain, every T-shirt, all that stuff. Like you know, it's it's not it's not some evil corporations sucking your dollars that's what we use to make the comics because yeah. we yeah. don't have any help it's totally grassroots Canadian and how has the response been so far has it been something that you're overwhelmed by hey people are liking this people are picking this up they're loving this comic yeah I, I, I at first I thought there might be you, you mentioned earlier of like a, of old fans like mm-hmm. reacting uh, the, the feedback we've gotten has been like universally positive like 99.99999% um, I expected some some bucking. Like uh, comic fans don't like it when you change the no, stuff. No, no, no. Um, but I, I think I feel like like I was saying like it's enough back in the ether that there's a fond memory, but no one's intensely attached to it right now. So people were a lot of surprise, a lot like a lot of there's a lot of oh I saw a new Captain Canuck comic, and I picked it up because I thought this is gonna suck or this is gonna be <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> gonna f- give this a flip for a laugh and then mm-hmm. flip flip. Hey, this is. Actually, kind of it good, and yeah. they're taking this seriously. Um, That's the thing; yeah. it's taking it seriously. You know, it's it's it's. I love the old Captain Canuck. Like sure. I have the, the the trade paperback. Well, I think issues. Richard was taking but it seriously then too. For he was, way. yeah, I think so. But the way that that original character sort of became 
the time traveling fighting dinosaurs kind of character. Right. Like, I mean, again, it wouldn't fly today, basically, especially with the aging population of comic book fans. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a comic book fan now. What I read now wouldn't, you know, while I was reading at 17 wouldn't appeal to me now. Sure. So I want something that's a modern spin. So that's yeah. why this is so fantastic. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. It's been really fantastic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we'll have everything up. Uh, I should have everything up this I'm evening. Gonna... I'll link everything on the Avalon Expo webpage. Okay, cool. Which is where right. we're hanging out for the weekend here at Avalon Expo. Um, yeah, before I forget. Before you forget, you have the you have the Dalek because tie. Because our, our previous episode, we had uh, Dave, Dave from, from Midnight, Midnight Tailors. Taylors. And uh, this is a tie from Dave from Midnight Tailors. Beauty. So I want to show people that this is locally made, you it's know, a, it's custom, a Dalek tie. custom made Dalek tie, and it, it looks good. It does. Thank you. And they've the like tailors right there. Yep. It retails for four dollars. And there's the tag for it as well. <laughs> this is just one of the hundreds of ties. Four dollars. Four dollars. Forty. 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 Okay. Okay. Forty. Four dollars is a bargain. Dollars. Is it four dollars? Uh, give me. I nine. bet you I can get for four dollars. <laughs> I bet you I try hard enough. <laughs> As he Rodney Dangerfield's list right, was next. That's right. So yeah, right. um, I hope you're enjoying your your day here at, at Avalon Expo and you enjoy the weekend so far, here in so Newfoundland. Good. So, yeah. and uh, thank you so very much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, I appreciate it. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank that's you. Right. Much. Thank you. Cheers. And Captain Canuck, folks. Captain Canuck is awesome. Like I said, I don't. Thank you, gentlemen.